for Q&A. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, your feedback on the feedback surveys from our other webinars has brought you this sovereignty series. Please make sure to complete the feedback survey that will be posted at the end of the webinar tonight. Whether you need renewal units or not, your feedback is so valuable. You do need to fill out a survey if you're receiving renewal units, and it will only be open until 3 p.m. tomorrow, and it will always only be open until 3 p.m. the following day after the webinar. So be sure to take the four to five minutes or less or more if you have lots to say about the webinar and complete it. Again, thank you so much for making this series happen, all of you. I couldn't be more excited about it, and we have an incredible lineup of presenters. Tonight, I would like to introduce and give a warm welcome to someone I am proud to call a friend, a mentor, and a colleague, Dr. Walter Fleming. Walter was born in Crow Agency and raised at Lane Deer, both in Montana. He is an enrolled member of the Kickapoo Tribe, Kip, excuse me, Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas. He graduated from Cole Strip High School, Dawson Community College, Eastern Montana, which is now MSU Billings, and Montana State University. His doctorate is in American Studies from the University of Kansas, and he started his teaching experience at Dawson Community College, but now he is the longest serving faculty member in the Native American Studies Department at Montana State University, where he is uh, the currently serving as the department head and has been for 20 years, and he has been in the NAS department for 43 years. So we are getting a wealth of knowledge this evening. Welcome, Walter, welcome. Good evening, everybody. Uh, hopefully, I, so um, I want to more formally introduce myself. Uh, my name is Walter Fleming, but in the Kickapoo language of which I'm a member, uh, my name is Wasasa, which means light lying down, and I'm a member of the White Bear Clan. And so uh, on behalf of all of all three Kickapoos in the state of Montana, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, uh, it's a little uh, strange um, not seeing everybody, and um, so I, I'm, the anxiety is a little high for me, uh, but uh, hopefully we can get through this. Um, I, I, I'm not real good at, at uh, technical stuff, and so Jennifer has promised to walk me through this, and so if at some point I'm doing this wrong, uh, you'll let me know, and she'll let me know. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started, and I'm going to try to share my screen, uh, and there's nothing to share. Oops, Walter, you got muted. So sorry about that. Have I been muted all the time? Nope, nope, nope. Just okay. for just right as you were switching to your slides. Okay. Well, I told you it was going to be fun. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. And so Jennifer's going to tell me if it's looking okay. Swap the screen again on display settings. Okay. Swap screen did it do anything it sure did perfect oh okay well then good I job can, then i can go on uh you'll have to realize folks that uh, that i was um, born in another century and uh so i'm still trying to figure out how to navigate this uh thing that we call the intro net and i don't have my tech support which is my seven-year-old granddaughter on hand uh, so this will be uh, hopefully a, a little um, more smooth as I go along and I get all of these buzzy um, emails from Jennifer saying, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. So, uh, but we're, we're going to go ahead and, and start. Uh, you, you might be somewhat curious about why we have a screen up that says Doctrine of Discovery or the Legacy of Columbus. And, and, and that's particularly since we're supposed to be talking about sovereignty. But uh, one of the things that we have to understand about sovereignty is that it's something that evolves over time and we have to start at the beginning, uh, wherever that beginning is. Now, I, I will 
offer this a bit of an explanation that I'm not actually going to be defining sovereignty because I think that is something that some of your presenters that's coming up are going to be doing. There are some very legal kind of uh, definitions that one has to consider within a context. So I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. Uh, but rather, what I'm going to do is is go back and and talk about the evolution of of uh, this idea of doctor, the doctrine of discovery and how that impacts upon sovereignty by uh, going back um, and, and tracing its evolution over time. And so we'll start uh, by talking about this fellow. Uh, you may recognize this guy, George W. Bush, 43rd president of the United States. And in 2004, at a press conference, uh, President Bush was asked uh, this question. What do you think tribal sovereignty means in the 21st century? And how do we resolve conflicts between tribes and federal and state governments? And, and that's a pretty provocative question, but his answer was even more fascinating. And so here is his answer to that question. Tribal sovereignty means uh, that uh, it's it's sovereign. You're you're a, you're a, you've been given sovereignty and viewed as a sovereign entity. And and one of the things that probably makes us a little awkward is, uh, and I tell my students this all the time, uh, you never use a word uh, to define a word. And in the case. Tribal sovereignty means that, but but um, there is another part of this that I'd like to discuss. Uh, but but first, we acknowledge, I guess, to to let George off the hook a little bit. It is a tough question, and and he is struggling with this because it, it's not an issue, it's not a topic, it's not a concept that that uh, we run across very often, and so uh, we can somewhat forgive uh, George W. for not being able to come up with a smooth answer to that question. However, there's a there's an aspect of that of that question. And again, I'll let others more expert than I define sovereignty in a in a in a legal um, or a political context. But uh, there is something to to his answer that is even more, I guess, of interest. And that is you've been given sovereignty. And, and so that is something that I'd like to explore is this notion that, that many people have, and it's, it is a misconception, that sovereignty is something that is given, and in this case, by the federal government to native tribes. And, and so that's a, that's a, um, a misconception that I, I think we'd, we'd uh, like to explore. And, and so that's the purpose of what, what my my uh, talk is going to be. In looking for a place to start, I think it's natural to want to start with Columbus. And, and we all know that, uh, that um, there's problems with starting with Columbus for a lot of reasons. And, and I think we've grown up, or at least in my generation, and, and I'm... Um, almost 70, so you can put that into whatever context you want. But I remember going to school and learning that little ditty uh, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And, and there's probably more to that song or whatever it is, but I never learned much more than, than what you see there. But the concept that was taught in schools when I was uh, a youngster, uh, was that's the beginning of American history. That's where where we began. That's page one of uh, our textbooks uh, from grade one uh, forward. Um, and obviously, there's some concerns about this idea about Columbus, and and usually it's it's focused on the on the idea of discovery. And, and we know it has consequence. And this is a Gary Larson cartoon um, with uh, the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria. And um, you know, uh, 
Let's see, I have to read it because uh, I can't see that far. Did you detect something a little ominous in the way uh, they said, see you later? later. And, and so we, we kind of understand that there's, there's some, uh, something about discovery that, that just is, is as, as these folks say, uh, ominous. And, and I, I think people have, have focused on the, the, the idea of, you know, uh, discovery. Um, and, and it's been part of the discussions I suppose we've had lately because of an issue that we've, we've um, uh, run into more recent, recently, and I'll talk about that as we go along. And, and so that there's this, this misconception about Columbus discovering America that I think schools have been really good at addressing. And, and I think uh, my generation certainly doesn't have to deal with that trope, with that idea that Columbus quote, discovered America. And, and in part, it's because we can point to uh, the voyages and, and, and show uh, that Columbus, in fact, didn't even make landfall in what is now the United States. And, and so there's, there's that part of the story where we can say, well, you know, um, this this uh, concept of discovery is is uh, is a fallacy. But one of the things that that um, we've run into more recently is uh, how do we frame uh, Columbus and Columbus Day? Uh, I, I recall just a couple of years ago, uh, we were out. Uh, we have a celebration in Bozeman called called um, a Christmas Stroll. And, and about that time, a group of people, and myself included in that, were, were uh, collecting signatures because we were, we were promoting replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. And so as a part of that process, we met with uh, MSU uh, folks and and um, we met with the mayor of Bozeman, we met with, with city commissioners. And so we were gathering uh, signatures at, at Christmas Stroll. And, and so I remember being in, in a little um, uh, covered uh, area and I, I had my clipboard and I was trying to get people to sign our petition. And, and the, this gentleman was coming down the street and I, I, I looked at him and of course I was trying to size him up because you, know, you don't want to waste effort asking people who you know and sign the petition. And, and so he came up to us and he said, what are you selling? And, and in a little gruff kind of voice, you know, I said, well, you know, we're not selling anything. Uh, we're just asking people to sign a petition. And he said, well, what, what's your, what, what's your petition about? And I said, well, we're, we're trying to replace Columbus Day. And, and he immediately perked up and he said, well, everybody knows that Columbus didn't discover America. And I, I, I was just ready to hand him the pen and he said, everybody knows that the, the, uh, the Vikings discovered America. And, and I think for people, it, it's still, they still haven't, got it. They still haven't made that transition from, well, it's not about discovery. It's about uh, something deeper than who discovered America. And obviously there's the, there's the, um, the reality that, that there were uh, millions of people living on the continents, continents of North and South uh, and Central America. Uh, before Columbus uh, made landfall in, in the Caribbean. And, and so I think we've done a really good job about talking about, about Columbus not discovering America because it was occupied, uh, that, that, um, you know, that the Vikings didn't discover America, although for some people that's the reality, and, and they still continue to, to push on that. Well, I'm, I'm not here to, to, to talk about that. I'm more interested in this doctrine of discovery, particularly the Christian doctrine of discovery and how that implies or um, how that reflects then um, on, on sovereignty. And, and it's, it's 
it's going to be a little looping around. So if you'll be patient with me, I uh, want to talk about this uh, within a context uh, that goes back uh, even before the voyages of Columbus. Because we have to recognize that this doctrine of discovery, title by discovery, um, not only is it false, but it has some, some implications on the issue of, of uh, sovereignty. So, so we'll get there. So be patient with me. In order to understand this, this title by discovery, we have to even go back before Columbus to, to um, a number of uh, antecedents that include papal bulls that were issued by popes, which uh, date back to, let's say, the, the middle of the, the 1400s. Uh, a papal bull, as I explained to my students, is, is, um, is a declaration by a, a, a pope. And it's a, basically then his opinion about issues which then become somewhat uh, the law of the land once they're issued. And so there are a number of them that we can look at that precede uh, or their antecedents to, to the to doctrine of discovery as it applies to, to the Americas. Uh, one of them is uh, the uh, Dom de Versas, um, and I'll do a little bit of a deeper dive on these uh, as we go. Uh, issued by Pope Nicholas IV in, in 1452. Another one of importance is um, Romanus uh, Pontifex by uh, the same Pope uh, Nicholas V, uh, this one in 1855. Uh, a papal bull a little bit later on in 1481 called um, Anturi uh, uh, Regis, uh, and then the latter one in 1493. Uh, by Pope Alexander the Sixth, enter uh, Satera, and and I, I I will admit that my my uh, Latin is really really bad. Uh, it's a uh, it's it's one of the the uh, number of courses that I flunked uh, growing up, and and I I know that some of you are sitting there like like um, Hermione and just wanting to say. Uh, it's not Romanus Pontificus, uh, it's uh, Wingardium Leviosa or something like that. I, I, I know that I'm not pronouncing these wrong, and so I apologize in advance for, for uh, the, the, the fingernails on the chalkboard as I try very hard to, to pronounce words that are uh, very much foreign to me. So I want to look at each of these, these uh, papal bulls and just kind of give, put them into a context. But the first one, uh, Dom, uh, I, I can say that, uh, Diversas uh, by um, Nicholas V in uh, June 18th, issued in June 18th of 1452, uh, translated to be until different. And, and that's uh, Nicholas V there giving you the stink eye. Um, and, and this particular papal bull has to do with uh, the, the authorizing the king of Portugal, Alfonso V, as, uh, as uh, Portugal starts to, to uh, go into Africa. And so uh, the, the Pope sees fit to provide this uh, instruction to, to the King of Portugal to, quote, uh, invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to take away all their possessions and property. So if we're trying to put this into context, uh, recognize that, that uh, essentially what this does is it grants uh, Portugal, uh, the right to to subdue all Saracens, and Saracens in this case are, are Muslims, uh, and pagans is anybody that's not a a Catholic or a, a Christian, and 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 so it it it, it um, 
gives permission, if you will, uh, for the acts of slavery and conquest that would come in Africa. The next one that follows in 1454, uh, Romanus Pontifex, uh, follows up on that previous papal bull. And what this does is it defines exactly where Portugal has authority to do all of this subjugation. And it defines lands south of Cape uh, Bojador in Africa, that's the most southern point in Africa, and I'll show you an illustration of that. So it, it encourages this, this seizure of lands, uh, but it also repeats then the earlier permission uh, to enslave all Saracens and, and pagans. And so it it really does repeat, repeat uh, much of the, the same, same permissions, if you will. Uh, but it likewise is an attempt to, to uh, resolve a, a, the beginnings of a, of a competition between Portugal and Castile. Okay, so Castile is not yet uh, a major player internationally, but it's beginning to grow as a superpower. And so right now it's contesting Portugal about uh, the explorations in, in Africa. Uh, if, if you don't recognize Castile, uh, you would then understand if I were to say this is pre-Spain or, or uh, proto-Spain, another a uh, fancy way of saying Castile then eventually becomes what we know as Spain. And so in, in Africa, we have the contestation between these two major superpowers, uh, Portugal and Spain or Castile, uh, over the, the dominion of the souls in, in Africa. And so the Pope is trying to resolve that conflict. He's trying to resolve uh, this this um, um, this contestation of, about about uh, the ex explorations of unknown lands, and and so one of the resolutions was to divide then um, Africa uh, by extending a line that 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 would define them. So here's Cape uh, Bojador, which is the southernmost tip. And so we've got Spain given con control over one section and, and um, Portugal given control over the other section. And, and that's why, as, as you probably know, Canary Islands are, are Spanish speaking and the Azores are likewise Spanish speaking because that line uh, separates them uh, north and south uh, the uh, control of uh, Portugal and Spain. Uh, there is a, a, a one that, that follows in eight, uh, Pope, Papal Bull that follows in 1481, which, uh, which clarifies uh, this situation a little bit more by a different Pope, Sixtus IV. Uh, Sixtus IV, that sounds odd to say, but at any rate, it it confirms uh, a treaty that had been negotiated between Castile and Portugal, in which then it defines that line, the Tropic of Cancer, as a defining line. But more to our story, uh, there is then another consideration that later on has to be made, and that is if we're dividing the world according to uh, Spain and Portugal, we've done it laterally. Uh, that is to say, we've used, we've used the, the uh, tropic of cancer to divide Africa. Uh, but what happens to uh, areas that we, we are currently exploring, particularly in, in the, uh, the East Indies? Now, we, we, we understand at this time that the East Indies are the spice islands where 
where uh, Europe was beginning to explore uh, with, with the uh, East, uh, East Indian trade. And, and we're referring to, of course, India and, and areas of, of that um, region. And, and so we're still not yet to the resolution about what happens in North and South America yet, but this particular papal bull brings into question, well, what about these other places? Uh, and, and so we can agree that the Canary Islands is, is Spanish. We can agree that, that the uh, Tropic of Cancer is that dividing line. And it more or less sets the stage for then uh, further uh, divisions of the world. So when in 1493, there is a recognition that there are other lands, uh, not in the East, but, but to the West, uh, presents a dilemma. Uh, and that is we, we need to draw more lines. Instead of drawing north south, we need we need uh, excuse me. Uh, instead of drawing more li lines east west, we now need to draw lines north south. And so, enter Satera, that papal bull, by uh, Pope Alexander the sixth in fourteen ninety three, does that. We now understand from the perspective of Spain and Portugal, that there are other lands to be divided up. And so a line is drawn and you can see a dotted line. That was the original line as, as, as um, resolved by Pope Alexander VI in, in 1493, based upon the uh, voyages of Columbus, having then come back in 1492. The line was uh, further um, extended in, in 1494, and you can see the more solid red line. And, and people perhaps uh, wonder, now why is of all of those countries in North and South America and Central America, why, why, why does Portugal speak, or why, why does uh, Brazil speak? Portuguese and not Spanish? And the answer is by papal direction then in the quote, new world, which is a phrase I don't particularly like. Brazil uh, was given over uh, control to, to Portugal. And by agreement then, the rest of the Americas controlled by Spain. And, and, and so this is where we're at as a result of those papal bulls, which are antecedents to, to uh, what we understand as, as the legacy of discovery in, in the Americas. Um, certainly, the stakes are pretty high. Uh, you can see where the uh, Portuguese um, uh, as a part of their economic growth, uh, depend a great deal upon uh, upon slavery, and that early papal bull, which gave them permission to to enslave uh, all Saracens and pagans, and so they took that took that to the to the max, and as a result, ten million enslaved peoples came to uh, North America, South America, and to the Caribbean. And, and, and so this is a part of our history that that uh, certainly we need to understand from a context uh, that uh, predates Columbus. And that's why uh, one of the things that we need to we need to talk about is is the period before 1492. And, and so you can see where the more dramatic impacts of slavery are, the slave trade, um, Brazil being, being that, uh, and then into the Caribbean with the Spanish, uh, as well as the Portuguese slave trade. So this dividing up the countries or the dividing up the world uh, certainly does have an impact. 
And when we look at the desire of Pope Alexander in issuing these, these, this papal bull, and he says as a part of that, the Catholic faith and Christian religion be everywhere increased and spread, and that barbaric, barbaric nations be overthrown and brought to the faith itself. There is an idea that I think has been long associated with this concept of Christian discovery, and that is this, this notion of uh, bakun uh, domicilium, which uh, we understand to mean uh, vacant land. And there is a quote from a clergy uh, person in a, in a book written in 1934 uh, by a reverend by the name of Solomon Stoddard. And this sentiment expressed in, in 1934, I think, is, is one that, that um, says aloud uh, what people think about, about the doctrine of discovery, but particularly uh, the, the lands to which that uh, those superpowers are laying claim. And, and that is, there is some part of the land that was not purchased, neither was there need that it should. It was vacuum domicilium, and so might be possessed by virtue of God's grant to mankind, uh, citing Genesis 1, uh, 28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and re replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Uh, he further uh, states, the Indians made no use of it, but for hunting. By God's first grant, men were to subdue the earth. When Abraham came into the land of Canaan, he made use of vacant land as he pleased. And so did Isaac and Jacob. And so part of this, this idea about, about the possession of, of, well, certainly the Americas, but every, every colonized country was that it wasn't being used in the proper way which um, is certainly defined by, the, by, um, by people in different ways. Uh, the Indians made no use of it but for hunting. And once you say but, that implies something. Now, there's also a, a, an other subtle message here, and that is what are, what are Native peoples? Um, we, we can recognize the difference between Christians and non-Christians, but there is also the implication that Native peoples are less than. Uh, they are not godly. They are, they are, um, but, but the question is, are they, are they, are they human? What justifies the taking of those lands? But the conclusion that that native peoples and, and I'm not saying native just for North and South America, but rather native to other parts of the land. And in fact, there's a there's a debate. Uh, Bartolome de la Casas and Sapulveda, uh, two great scholars. Uh, de la Casa is a is a, a priest uh, in in the Americas. Uh, who in this debate in 1550 takes the possession takes the position that that native peoples uh, uh, are are human and have rights uh, as humans, and so Pul uh, Vida takes the position that that they are not they do not have souls. Uh, native peoples uh, do not have souls and therefore have no rights. And, and so there, think of that in 1550 as a debate that needs to be had. And, and so the church is, is uh, 
assuming that 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 uh, you know maybe peoples uh, uh, do not have rights as as humans because they are subhuman. Uh, fortunately, I suppose at some point De La Casas his arguments uh, went out, and and so the church uh, considers that that uh, native peoples are human, but they need guidance, and and the guidance that they need is is uh, provided for them by the church with a capital C. So. What does this have to do anything with anything? And 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 as we're considering, okay, so so that's all kind of background stuff. And and so how does that apply to the issue of, of sovereignty? And and I I I think I've hinted at it in a couple of ways. Uh, and and so let's be a little bit more direct with that. The reason why we we discuss those predecessing um, um, part of history is that this doctrine of discovery became adopted by into into the United States fabric in 1823 uh, as a result of a Supreme Court case called. Johnson versus Macintosh. And so what basically what happened is the United States, which didn't exist as we know in 1483, uh, which didn't exist in 1492, which didn't exist in 1775, and doesn't have a colonial history, at least in the same way that England or Portugal or France or Great Britain does. Nonetheless, by virtue of the application of this doctrine of discovery, um, embraced its, its concepts. So, so we have to talk about a little bit how, how that can be in, in 1823. And so this case, Johnson versus McIntosh, in 1773, before there is a such thing as the United States, between 1773 and 1775, the chiefs of several Indian tribes in um, Michigan, uh, well, Illinois, uh, the, the tribes were the Illinois tribe and the Pankishaw tribe. They, they sold some land to a gentleman by the name of Thomas Johnson. Okay, so pretty straightforward that these cheese sold some land to Thomas Johnson. Uh, fast forward a little bit when then later these same chiefs then signed an agreement with the United States retaining some lands, but then ceding other lands to the U.S. Okay, so there is some transactions that are going on. So now the United States find themselves in possession of lands that formerly belonged to the Illinois and Pankishaw tribes. And through, through an agreement that they reached with those same tribes. So the United States then sells some of that land to a third party, a gentleman by the name of William McIntosh. So, so Mr. Thomas Johnson's descendants, his, his ancestors said, wait a minute, you, you can't do that because we own that land having purchased it directly from the Illinois and Pankinshaw. So, so, so William McIntosh doesn't own this land. We own it because we bought it from the original inhabitants of this land. That kind of makes sense. And so this goes to the Supreme Court. 
so we have this uh, rather, uh, and and it's not as dramatic as this might, you know, this illustration might make it. It's not exactly the fight of the century, uh, but it's one of the uh, court decisions that not a lot of people are aware of. Now, just for context, this is the the uh, um, Supreme Court, uh, the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is a gentleman by the name of John Marshall. And so this is often called uh, one of three Marshall decisions of some import. Um, one of the, the, the trilogy called, called the Marshall um, Trilogy. Three, this is one, let me speak English here. This is one of three court cases that make up the Marshall Trilogy. Thank you very much, Walter. So, so when we talk about the Marshall Court, uh, obviously there are other justices, but he's speaking on behalf of the, of the Supreme Court here. So the decision of the court in Mac Johnson versus McIntosh is that Christian European nations had assumed, quote, and this is from the, the language of the case, ultimate dominion over the lands of America during the age of discovery. Upon, quote, discovery, then, native peoples lost, quote, their rights to complete sovereignty as independent nations. So, so let's look, read that again. John Marshall's court holds that upon discovery, native peoples lost, quote, their rights to complete sovereignty as independent nations. So when we're talking about the erosion of sovereignty and the assumption that these tribal communities had complete sovereignty, that is that they acted on their own behalf as, um, as independent and autonomous units, political units. They lost that sovereignty when the lands were discovered. So, so that's a pretty, pretty big deal. What the court goes on to say is that tribes retain a right of, quote, occupancy in their land. Now, the, the really crazy thing is, is that this introduces a concept that doesn't exist in American jurisprudence, this idea that there is a category of ownership that suggests that if you occupy lands, you have certain rights, but it doesn't, just, it doesn't describe what those rights are. It's just that you, because you were living on that land, you have certain rights, the right to occupy that land, but you don't own it. Now, now this does fall into another point of discussion and that is, all right, well, how do we conceive of ownership? And naturally we have these different kinds of viewpoints, what, what the European model is saying and what English law suggests is that there is a conveyance of title and that conveyance of title comes from a particular process, uh, perhaps the, the sovereign, you know, we're using sovereign to describe the, the king or queen or whatever, the sovereign, um, uh, by some mechanism transfers the right of the sovereign, sovereign to other individuals. But, but title, is a, a transferable kind of concept. So, so lands can be owned, it can be transferred. Now, on, in contrast, that a lot of native tribes would believe that, that you can't own the land. It's, it's like you can't own, you can't own the air. It's, it's not a material possession. It's nothing that can be transferred. And, and uh, so already we have these differences and in, in, I guess concepts. But this one becomes a legal precedent to describe 
understand what native tribes can and cannot, uh, what can and cannot be assumed about tribal ownership of land. So the upshot of that is that Marshall rules for the court that Indian tribes cannot convey land to private parties without the consent of the federal government. You know, we, we do recognize this is in, in 1823. And as a product of that, uh, I, I do note that the, the balance of power has shifted. At the time when the um, Continental Congress signed its first treaty with the Delaware tribe, it was in 1775, 1776, and it was 1776. It was a treaty of non-alliance. It, it guaranteed that the Delaware tribe would not side with the British in the Revolutionary War. And so that's the first treaty that we can trace that eventually becomes uh, a part of the American system of, of relating with native tribes. But what that treaty implies is that it's a contract between two or more equal parties. So the party of the first part, the American, well, not the American government, it would be the Continental Congress, which pre, pre, precedes then, then the Federalist, uh, the American government. But it implies that the Delaware tribe is an equal, on equal footing with uh, with, uh, with the uh, original thirteen colonies as they are uh, vying for freedom. So, the getting back to getting back to the doctrine of discovery, Justice Marshall then rules that Indian tribes cannot convey land. So, so again, this is in 1823, and, and things change as a result of uh, the War of 1812, when the United States uh, establishes that it, it can fend for itself uh, against uh, Great Britain, and, and eventually uh, defeats Great Britain in the War of 1812. So that, that equality that, that Indian tribes enjoyed with the American government after that, after eight, uh, the Battle of uh, the War of 1812, just um, changes the balance of power does. So, the courts rule that discovery gave title to the government by whose subject or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments. And again, the United States didn't discover Jack. Pardon, uh, the United States then. When okay, so so conceptually, I suppose with it, let's take a concrete example. Um, when the United States purchased the uh, Louisiana Purchase, that area in in um, eighteen o three or eighteen o four, it purchased uh, Louisiana territory from the French. The French gained title to that by the virtue of the explorations of La Salle and Cartier having sailed uh, in, the, in the Great Lakes and then the Mississippi River uh, down to the Gulf of Mexico. And so this idea that we're, we're claiming parts of, of Native America um, is then made, made constitutionally legal by this interpretation. Discovery gives title to the government. And so the United States has gained title by, by gaining it from the people who discovered that land. I suppose then conceptually, again, when you look at, well, what did, why, why have these treaties by which land is ceded and between 18, 51 and 1870 or so, uh, there were a lot of treaties which we dealt with the cession of land. And when we look at the over 500 treaties that were signed between the federal government and Indian tribes, a third of them dealt with treaties of peace. And that would be things like the, the treaty between uh, 
Continental Congress and, and the Delaware. Uh, but two thirds of those treaties were cessions of land. So I guess, I guess from one legal authority, you could suggest that what the United States does in these treaties is not acquire land, but rather extinguish the the uh, occupational right that a tribe has to that land, and and so that's a that's a kind of a new concept. It, it's one that I suppose could be applied internationally in terms of other international, you know, other indigenous peoples. And and so that's the importance of of um, uh, chair uh, of um, uh, Johnson versus McIntosh. It, it made legal uh, this idea of, of a title by discovery. And, and so it becomes really important to understanding, well, what follows? How can the United States then acquire lands that it does not itself discover? Because the United States isn't out there, quote, discovering lands. It, it might also be productive, and I just realized that I'm using a different version of this, and so I wasn't prepared to talk about the Constitution quite. Let, let me let me just jump forward here. Ah, I can still do it. Yay me! Um, I, I I I do want to complete a thought, and and that thought is the other two court cases that constitute the, uh, the, the, uh, the Marshall Trilogy. And, and the other two cases are Cherokee versus Georgia and Wooster versus Georgia. And in order to talk about those, we have to look at, at native um, uh, representation or mention in the, in the US Constitution. And, and it might not be one that most people think about, but there are several places in which Native peoples or Indians, as one will call, um, appear in, in the U.S. Constitution. And so there it is. Uh, we, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a perfect union, which all of us had to memorize back in the olden days. Article 1, which describes the legislature legislative uh, powers, section one, section two. In section two, it describes uh, then the House of Representative. And this is the, the first, rep first uh, mention of uh, American Indian people in the Constitution. And it says, uh, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states, which may be included within this union according to their respective num numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, this is indentured servants, and excluding Indians not taxed. Then it goes on to, to describe three-fifths of all other persons referring to slaves, and we know that history about uh, enslaved people being considered uh, three fifths of an individual, but it does mention Indians not taxed, and so it does create a category. So you must have then two kinds of Indians: Indians taxed and Indians not taxed. And there's never really any clarity uh, in the Constitution about what that means, but we understand it to mean that there are some Native peoples who have assumed at least some degree of, of assimilation into American society, and they are owning land, they are uh, paying taxes on that land because that's what we're looking at in terms of representatives, those direct taxes. And so that's, that's one place in which Native peoples are included in the Constitution. The other place is actually in an amendment, and this one is 14th Amendment, which uh, again talks about um, uh, about representatives, and it um, 
Section 2, representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole person of a whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. So they retain that concept of Indians not taxed are not included, Indians taxed are. And again, I think we're talking about, well, not I think, but we're talking about then about uh, an implied citizenship that comes with with being taxed. So one of the other places, and I'm just somewhat skipping around because of concept here, is in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, uh, which are, are uh, the, um, the Commerce Clause, as it's called. And uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 says, Congress shall have power, and then there's a couple of provisos, and it says to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and with, with Indian tribes. Uh, and so it, it gives then Congress the power to regulate tribes with, uh, regulate commerce with Indian tribes. That becomes important with the second of the three um, um, Marshall Trilogy court cases. And that's Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, which is uh, in 1831. So the first is, is, is Johnson versus McIntosh and then Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. The specifics on this is that gold is discovered on Cherokee lands and Georgia is, the Cherokee lands are within the state of Georgia. Uh, Georgia comes after the, okay, so so the state of Georgia is, is uh, not as old as Cherokee land, so we know that. So the Cherokees sued the state of Georgia because the state of Georgia had passed a number of, uh, amount of le legislation which dealt with Cherokee lands. And uh, for example, the state of Georgia uh, disallowed tribal courts in the state uh, in, in Cherokee Nation, which were then a violation of Cherokee sovereignty because the state of Georgia was extending its sovereignty into Cherokee lands. So the Cherokees sued the state of Georgia. Uh, they then filed an injunction to prevent the execution of these acts by the legislature of the state of Georgia onto Cherokee lands. Okay, so 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 that's that's Cherokee versus Georgia. Now the the resolution to this case comes as a result of Article Three, Section Two, Clause One, and I'm putting the whole thing out here because it is quite complicated. And here's the irony is that is that the court ruled in Cherokee versus Georgia that it couldn't rule. It ruled that it couldn't rule. What it says is that we do not have jurisdiction over this case. And the reason why we don't have jurisdiction over this case is because it's very, uh, there is a, a, a description about judicial powers. And it extends to all cases arising from this constitution. Of course, the Supreme Court deals with constitutional law. And then it lists uh, Article 3, uh, clause, Section 2, Clause 1, lists the cases. And it says, here they are. Cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. Okay, so, so Cherokee versus Georgia. It's not a maritime case, so it doesn't deal with affairs at sea. So that, that doesn't count. To controversies to which the United States shall be a party. Well, the United States isn't a party, it's Cherokee versus Georgia. To controversies between two or more states. Well, is, is Cherokee, the Cherokee nation a state? Question mark between a state and citizens of another state, 
uh, Cherokees are not citizens of any state. So that one doesn't apply. Between citizens of different states, again, the question, what is the nature of Cherokee nation? Between citizens of the same state in claiming lands under grants from different states, nope, that one doesn't apply. And between a state and citizens thereof and foreign states, citizens and subjects. So the question then before the Supreme Court, is Cherokee Nation a state? And, and, and seemingly no, it, it, it does not it come into the fold as a state. Is it a foreign state? Well, that's a question. That's a great question. And so what the Supreme Court has to do is rule on whether or not Cherokee, and, and hence all Indian tribes, are foreign states. So the court rules that Cherokees are not foreign states. And so therefore, Cherokee Nation doesn't have any any um, recourse in American court systems because they don't fall under that list that are there uh, as prescribed by the Constitution. Marshall's decision and hence the court's decision that, that tribes are domestic dependent nations. Now, now th they didn't have to say that. They didn't have to say this is what they are. They could have left it vague, but the court goes on to say, okay, they're not states, they're not, they're not foreign states. So what are they? They are domestic dependent nations. And this is something that is, is created. This is this is a status that's created. It, it doesn't say anything in the Constitution that there is such a thing as domestic dependent nations. Further, that their relations to the United States resembles that of a ward to his guardian. And that has come back to haunt Native people's sense that the idea that Indian people are war like wards to a guardian. And, and, and it's important that to note that it says their relationship resemble. It doesn't say are but it rather resembles that of a ward to his guardian. So I think there's this concept that Indian people are wards to the government. It doesn't say that. Marshall's decision doesn't say that. Further, that Indian tribes were, quote, a distinct political society separate from others, capable of managing their own affairs and governing themselves. Again, there's some vagueness about this. What is it meant by distinct political society? And, and that becomes rather fascinating because when you think about this, you know, why Native peoples or tribes have a, a, a different kind of relationship to the American government and that Native peoples, for example, um, why can, can, can Indian tribes own casinos. And it's because they are a distinct political society. Uh, we have recent kind of concerns about, um, about affirmative action and um, the fact that there are some scholarships that go to certain peoples like women that have been deemed uh, not legal because because um, you know you can't discriminate based upon gender, and and so can Indian people still get scholarships? Well, uh, yes, they can because we are members. We we are not an ethnic group. We are distinct political society, and so therefore, uh, the the all the rules are different. And, and, and so that's, that's one explanation that a lot of people aren't aware of is that, is that uh, the reason why, um, you know, that the, some of those kind of application of laws are not, are not the same for based upon uh, 
race or or ethnicity. It's because Indian people are not ethnically uh, a, a race, but we are a political society. But then there's that other thing, separate from others capable of managing their own affairs. So it seems to contradict Wooster, Wooster, uh, excuse me, it seems to contradict uh, the other court case, Johnson versus McIntosh. Capable of managing their own affairs implies sovereignty. Uh, but it also says capable. It doesn't say they have the right to manage their own affairs. But again, it's not sovereignty that, I mean, it, it, it's, we still have to go back to that concept. Well, who are the United States to grant sovereignty to uh, people who are already sovereign? Well, anyhow, um, to complete a thought, we have then to look at the third case to find a resolution of whose law is the supreme law of the land. Is it the Georgia state law as it applies to Cherokee Nation, or is it Georgia, the, or is it Cherokee Nation? And so uh, in 1832, there is another court case called Wooster versus Georgia. And there's, there's Samuel Wooster. And so Samuel Wooster is a minister who is living on and practicing his profession. Uh, in Cherokee lands. So, so he, he is there uh, as the guest of the Cherokee nation, the, the Cherokee tribe. The state of Georgia passed a law that says anybody doing business in Cherokee nation has to have a permit or a license issued by the state of Georgia. Samuel Wooster did not have a permit. So he was arrested, tried, found guilty of violating Georgia state law, and was sentenced to uh, a, a period of hard labor in, in prison. He filed then um, a, a, a writ of habeas corpus, and so that went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court then now could hear this case because Samuel Wooster is a citizen of the state of Georgia. So he is bringing suit against the state of Georgia as a citizen. So that is fine. And so the Cherokee Nation comes as a friend of the court kind of thing. And so the Supreme Court now can consider whose law is the supreme law of the land because Wooster is obeying one set of laws issued by the state of Georgia or the, the Cherokee tribe while violating the other. And so the case in this instant was that the Cherokee laws are the supreme law of the land, at least as it applies to Cherokee nation. Marshall says, Indian nations have always been considered distinct independent political communities, retaining their own natural rights as the undisputed possessors of the soil. Uh, not quite sure what natural rights are. Again, like occupational rights, still somewhat of a vague concept, but there we go. Further, that the court held that tribal sovereign powers are not relinquished when Indian tribes extinguish land for peace or protection. Now, I, I, I'm not going to deal with what sovereignty means. That's somebody else's job, I, I think. But still, as we look at it, the courts at least are holding that sovereign powers are not linquished, relinquished when a Indian tribe exchanged peace for uh, land for peace and protection. So again, that idea uh, of sovereignty being, and again, we have this contradiction in, in the legis in the several cases that we've looked at so far. 
there is a Paul Harvey ending to this. And I don't know if people are old enough to remember Paul Harvey. Uh, I, I do. And, and to explain for you young people, Paul Harvey was a commentator on the radio that we always used to listen to about noontime. And he would tell the story about some young boy who was born in poverty and who worked hard shining shoes. And uh, uh, one day he shined the shoes of a, of a wealthy patron and the wealthy patron said, you should go to college. And then there was the Paul Harvey Indian. And so the kid went to college and, and the Paul Harvey Indian was usually, and that boy, there was always this pause and that boy grew up to be John Marshall. And now you know the rest of the story. So there is a Paul Harvey ending to that. And, and that is that President Andrew Jackson, who was the president during the time when these court cases were being decided, supposedly said, Marshall has ruled, now let him enforce it. What he meant was, that there were some policies, some acts that were passed by the federal government, which demanded the removal of Indian tribes from uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, um, throughout the South. And those removal policies those removals acts obviously were, were uh, predicated by the idea that the state of Georgia wanted to gain control over Cherokee lands to take possession of the gold that was discovered there. And so that essentially is what Jackson is saying. So he refused to call federal support, uh, federal troops out to keep miners from going into to Cherokee lands and essentially gave his stamp of approval to the, the, um, the uh, takeover of Cherokee lands. And consequently, the Cherokees were removed uh, to Indian Territory, which is now Oklahoma. And we know the consequence of that as the Trail of Tears. Um, I, I have a bit of a personal connection, and that is my great, 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 and I don't know how many greats, grandmother uh, was among the last of the Cherokees to, to make it to Oklahoma. And consequently, um, uh, Rebecca, uh, Grandma Rebecca was, uh, was, was that lady. So when we're looking at this idea of sovereignty, it's a concept. And it's one that uh, evolves. And, and, and so one of, the, one of the challenges is, is that how do we read it today versus how has it evolved? And, and I mentioned uh, uh, negotiating treaties as a part of that, of that, um, of that process. And, and so we could then further our look at, at the predecessors to contemporary sovereignty by looking at, at and it's applicable that, uh, that we do it today. Uh, when we talk about treaties, because when we look at treaties, they are contracts between sovereign nations. And the contract, uh, the, the Constitution, if, if you read the Constitution, authorized the president uh, uh, with the consent of two thirds of the Senate to make treaties on behalf of the United States. And, and we can see in the Constitution that's contained within Article 2, Section 2, uh, Clause 2. Um, And, and, and so we can follow that, that idea about the supreme law of the land. 
and uh, it is defined according to case law as uh, treaties are 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 superior to state laws and constitution, but are equal in rank to laws passed by Congress. And we know that treaties can be made on any subject, uh, except that they can't deprive a citizen of their rights as guaranteed by the Constitution. For example, you can't make a treaty denying people the right to vote, uh, for example, and that's in the Constitution. Uh, all of these then have some constitutional tests. Uh, one of the things that happens is that in 1871, the United States uh, stopped making treaties with Indian tribes. And primarily the reason for that is because, as we know, they're only, uh, they only uh, follow one, one side of the house. And so the Senate is the ones who confirm uh, treaties. So the House of Representatives is, is left out of that process. So the House of Representatives um, protested that, you know, look, Indian, Indian affairs is being conducted by only one side. Uh, it's only being conducted by, by the senators. And so that seems not right. And so after 1871, uh, 1871 then, then treaties were no longer, um, no longer a part of, of of uh, American Indian politics, uh, but they still, of course, become very important. And so, this I, the 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 notion about sovereignty is also implicit in the idea that Indian tribes can sign treaties with the American government based upon this idea that treaties are contracts between sovereign nations, and, and we can see that the United States signed a treaty with the Panama Canal returning control over the, the Panama Canal to the Panamanian government. We signed treaties that ended wars. Uh, the Treaty of, of um, well, not um, Gantt or treaty, treaties that begin wars, treaties that end wars. And so conceptually, this idea of sovereignty uh, pokes up in, in lots of different places, but we can certainly look at it as uh, part of that treaty making process. I, I, I'm conscious of time and so I, I'm looking at uh, that and I'm going to, I think, discontinue my share, stop sharing and get back to this screen. Uh, I haven't been looking at uh, any chat questions and so uh, I think this is the time where we begin to ask questions, and if there are any, I will um, endeavor to answer them. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I will make something up, and it's just up to you to try to figure out which is which. Well, thank you, Walter. It is always so illuminating to get um, an overview, you know, like that, because I hear, you know, when I, when I, teach about the essential understandings, you know, we've got the federal policy periods and, you know, under this, there's, you know, there's this Marshall trilogy and, and um, I don't very often go back and think about, you know, all of the pieces from, you know, the requerimiento and the doctrine of discovery and the papal bulls all the way through. So it, that was awesome. Um, yes, if anybody has any questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, we haven't had any uh, questions in the chat, I don't believe. I've been trying to. Um, I, one person remembers Paul Harvey, as do I. Good day. Good day. <laughs> and. Um, I have added also all of the documents that Walter referred to. I've added to um, the resource list the, for the participant resource folder. And um, I, if I there was a lesson plan associated with it, I tried to um, attach that um, for, for your convenience. Um, but yes, if anybody has any questions, please do put them in the chat now. And 
while you are um, typing away, I will go ahead and, and say that uh, Senator Shane Morjo is our next presenter, not next Tuesday, because next Tuesday is election day. Well, here's my ballot anyway. Um, <laughs> um, so please make sure you get out and vote. So we have no webinar next uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. And then the following week um, on Tuesday, we will have uh, Senator Moore show. On Wednesday night, we have our uh, boarding school series, and that will be our last one with Sarah Young. And then on Thursday night, we will have uh, Leah Whitford from Browning, and she is also um, a former congresswoman and has an enormous amount of experience. And um, it's really, I'm excited um, to, to have, a, and Leah just said she has started to bookmark the resources provided, and she says uh, it's one subject she really enjoys learning about. Great job, Professor. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Someone's not sure how to access the folder. Let me go back and put that link. Um, again, we've got a few minutes for questions if anybody has any questions. And here is the participant folder. There you go. There's the link to that. And if anyone has any particularly, um, you know, res great resources that they've used in the past, please feel free to share those. I am happy to put those in um, on the resources as well. So, um, Walter, I'm curious, you know, with um, without getting, you know, political, but would tribal sovereignty ever be in danger? Well, it's it's in danger every day. I mean, with every court decision, there's a set of precedents. And so when you think about sovereignty, there's the whole concept that that the the entities are uh, autonomous um, and contain, you know, powers of, of uh, over internal and external affairs. We already see that there has been a division between how the courts have looked at criminal jurisdiction versus civil jurisdiction. And there was, uh, for example, in criminal jurisdiction, a case called um, uh, Ex parte Crow Dog. And in Ex parte Crow Dog, Crow Dog had committed a, a, a murder and uh, had gotten away with it because was only required to pay restitution to the family of, and this is in 1884 or five, uh, had to pay restitution, which was in accordance with tribal law. And that, that is vernacular tribal law. And the agent at the, uh, at the local Lakota agency said, you know, this guy's gotten away with mur murder. We need to we need to try him for the murder of, of Spotted Tail. And so Crow Dog was arrested and then a trial was held. He was found um, guilty, sentenced to be hanged, went home, asked for permission to go home and get his affairs in order. In what is an incredible decision, the court said, oh yeah, go ahead, come back and we'll hang you. But in the meantime, there was a court case then started on his behalf called Ex parte Crodog, uh, deliver the body of Crodog. And, and the court ruled that, that uh, double jeopardy was, was implied. And so he was freed. But that so incensed the public that they said, we can't, we can't have people getting away with murder like this in the 1885 sensibility of things. So we will pass a law called the Seven Major Crimes Act, which defined tribal authority is limited to, um, is, is, okay, I said that wrong. The federal government has jurisdiction over the following seven crimes, and then it defines them. Well, that erodes then the sovereign right that a tribe has over criminal jurisdiction in its territories. Now, the same happens with civil jurisdiction as those are so slowly eroded. 
the right to uh, uh, regulate gaming on their own reservation. Well, now that's that's a part of a of, of a process because of the passage of the the, the federal uh, gaming regulation act. Um, puts that into a different category of, you know, you negotiate a compact with the state uh, in which the tribe is. And so that that takes away a part of the the, the uh, uh, civil jurisdiction. And so it just starts nibbling away. Uh, but we also have to, rem we have to remember that a tribe has a sovereign rights over, uh, uh, unless those are, those are reduced. And so they start off with, with every right as a sovereign, and then they're slowly picked off one by one. So the, the long answer is, yeah. Okay, we've got some good questions. Um, uh, Art, the what it asks, what is the connection of blood degree and tribal sovereignty? And that will be answered in an entire webinar with Mike Jetty. And so um, stay tuned for that. Make sure to, to either come to that one live or watch the recording. And I believe that will be December 6th. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Okay, let's see. Um, do the Marshall Court rulings still apply? I'm asking because I teach Montana tribes um, have sovereignty. And um, I Wait, believe I... that they do still apply. Yeah, and that's, and that's so, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to would would have to talk about in terms of treaty uh, treaty rights. Um, that's usually where where it's implied is that uh, a tribe has uh, those rights until uh, until uh, taken away. But having a treaty of bridge doesn't abrogate it. Doesn't necessarily change that. Um, but I may not be answering the right. Well, I, I like this. So it, it is like the tribes have sovereignty until the government wants something they have. Yeah, and 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 so <laughs> treaties actually are a mechanism by which tribes uh, grant rights to the federal government. So it's kind of a odd way to do that. Uh, the government considers the Cherokee tribe their own separate nation and entity. The 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 uh, Cherokee versus Georgia establishes a, uh, a concept that doesn't exist that's a domestic dependent nation. So the term nationhood is implied there, which implies sovereignty, but a domestic dependent. That part is a little tricky because the I, I would explain the domestic part is that Indian tribes, their lands are within or domestic to the United States, so it's 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 areas that are within the body that we call the United States. De dependent is a little less clear. Uh, it's that relation be relationship between the uh, the United States and Indian tribes as being dependent on one another in one extraction of that. Uh, but the other way in which some people choose to 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 think about it is that tribes are dependent upon the federal government for um, resources, which I don't think is, is what the martial courts meant, but it is confusing. So domestic dependent nation. Now, later on, you guys will have to talk about with somebody else, uh, the uh, Bill Clinton uh, uh, executive order, which then confers the nation to nation relationship between federal government and Indian tribes in which the federal agencies uh, must consult with Indian tribes uh, at, at the levels in which uh, interactions take place. Uh, I, I don't have that to show, but, but uh, certainly people can look at that nation to nation concept by Bill, that uh, President Clinton's administration. And, and that's, a, that's a, a recent turn. So we've gone from that pattern, uh, patriarchal kind of concept like the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, the Great White Father. And then so we have this change in the way that the federal government chooses to interact with Indian tribes. That is, we're going to consult with Indian tribes and that's the nation to nation. That's fairly recent. That's, that's the Clinton administration. 
right. uh, and, and so, you know, again, this idea about sovereignty ebbs and flows and and Indian tribes are as sovereign as the federal government will allow them to be. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, that is all we have time for. What? And um, with the uh, the tribal consultation, um, uh, Donnie Wetzel has been added to the docket. He will be our final uh, uh, webinar of, with sovereignty, and he'll be talking about tribal cons consultation and that relationship between um, the state government and tribes, as well as other entities who are doing businesses with tribes. So um, I hope that you find throughout all seven of the webinars um, something that will address you know some of these more specific. Uh, you know, issues and, and very contemporary topics. So I love how it, it came about that um, started way back when, and we're still talking about it now, and it is still a contemporary topic. So Walter, thank you so, so much. We're seeing lots of thank yous and lots of um, enlightening presentation, lots of positives. So um, just really appreciate your time and your expertise. And it was such an honor um, when you said yes, that you would present uh, for us. So thank you so much. Everyone, please have a safe uh, November, and we will see you back here on November 15th is our next webinar. So have a great next week and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye now.